Hey, hey, Wayne, I thought you were going to be on earlier this week. Why, why didn't you show up? <laughs> I, uh, I got bumped out by the water guy, but, and that's okay because I needed the water here at the golf course. Well, that's, so I'm glad that's the water true. guy came on. But you know, it would have been uh, courte- more courteous of Rob if he had told you before the facts instead of having you drive all the way over, come into the studio. He looked at you, and said, "What are you doing here? That You're not helped. booked." <laughs> it it would have helped. It's 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 pick on Rob day. Yeah. Don't worry, Admiral. Your intro's coming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Delegate Wayne Clark, good morning to you. Thanks so much for joining us, sir. Good morning. Thank you. I'm, I'm in my car heading to the golf course. We have a tournament here at 9. But, uh, you know, um, would have loved to be in studio um, Wednesday. But, uh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I deserve it all. I do. <laughs> I do. For those of you not in on the inside joke, I had, Wayne and I had texted earlier on the weekend last week, and uh, uh, we agreed that Wayne would come on the program on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. And when Wayne showed up Tuesday at 9 o'clock, I looked at him like, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm on the schedule today. And I said, no, you're not. And he said, yes, I am. <laughs> I've got a text that says September 6th. Uh, and uh, I looked at him and I went, oh, no. And I had actually, actually put Wayne down on Wednesday on my calendar instead of Tuesday. I put him on the 7th or 3rd. I get my, get my dates all messed up here. So whatever it is, we thank him for his understanding. Uh, Wayne, uh, you're headed to uh, Charleston for interims. Now, who's your roommate? Or is it you and Hardy? Oh, no, 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 no. I stay uh, by myself. Um, I know better than get get involved with staying with other guys because they they tell too many secrets. But no, um, <laughs> what are you hiding? <laughs> I'm not hiding anything. I snore like a champion, so um, you know I feel bad for the the person that uh, stays in the room next to me. Bill does you know. too, by the way. I can hear him during some of our less active interviews. <laughs> I was leaning back thinking that time <laughs> when you were on with Gilstrap, you were yeah, you were a, snoring a couple. I had times. a colleague, a, a fellow that I learned much from uh, uh, years ago, and he would concentrate by throwing his head back, looking like he was asleep, but he was acutely conscious. Uh-huh. And I caught myself on air doing the same thing the other day. It's somewhat embarrassing, I must admit. Drop. <laughs> uh, Wayne, what are you hoping to accomplish uh, in your committees with these interims? Well, I mean, one of the fun things about the interims is is that we get to hear stories of what's going on um, throughout the state um, from from people without, you know, having to have public hearings and things like that. They can do little presentations to us. Um, so, like, coming up here on Sunday, we have our economic development uh, uh, interims, and we have um, we have presentations with folks that are talking about, uh, you know, wineries, issues that they have with, with the wineries, um, issues that, that small businesses are having with um, with their uh, um, employment, you know, finding people to work. I mean, oh, gosh, it is the, probably the worst thing that's going on right now with our, our small businesses. So it's good to hear from those. Um, in education on Sunday, we're going to be touring uh, Herbert Hoover, uh, high school that's the one that uh, we had all the flooding issues with back uh, several years um, and uh, you know so we're going to tour what they've done uh, in, in regards to fixing that and then you know getting together with with all the other delegates and you know chatting up about issues that are that are going on in their area and how we can help um, a little more relaxed mode than than that high paced uh, when we're in session so you know, I, I really enjoy going down for the interims and, and, and meeting with everybody. Um, you know, this is uh, Mike's first uh, run at the interims, you know, and we haven't had that many because of all the renovations going on down at the Capitol. Yeah. But uh, they're really, really great for, for you know, coming in strong for in, in January with our, with our bills and, and our priorities. You are the vice chair of economic development and tourism in the uh, interim sessions. So maybe you can tell me in regards to wineries, because you brought that up. Yes. Uh, within a, uh, a very quick drive of Harper's Ferry, you've got several Maryland and Virginia wineries easily uh, tended by people who are touring the area. Why right. are there more West Virginia wineries to, to uh, offer the different options to people that are in Harper's Ferry? 
What do we what do we need you know, to do you, legislatively? You ask a great question because we have the same terrain, we have the same weather. Um, the biggest thing we don't have, we don't have the same legislature. Um, so, you know, Max, who is our, our staff attorney for economic development, tourism, um, we have taken the entire wet, uh, Virginia um, uh, code and we're trying and we're mirroring that in with our West Virginia code. We've sent a draft over to um, uh, Fred Wooten and Anoop over at ABCA for them to review um, and give us ideas of some changes that we may need to make or whatever. But we're, we're doing everything we can to kind of even the playing field between the two of them. Um, but there are so many little things that are just like offset that, you know, um, that, you know, causing all kinds of problems. You know, um, last session we uh, did an ABCA uh, rewrite of, um, and we introduced a new a new program, which is called the POTUS, which is a public outdoor designated area. What that basically does is gives your municipalities the option of creating this space. And so if you have a uh, patron at Restaurant A and they said, well, I want to go and walk over to Restaurant B, um, can I take my drink to go? Well, they they all share the same uh, they all buy the same uh, designated cup, and so patron can grab their cup and make their way over to restaurant B. And when they arrive at restaurant B, they can, you know, um, order food and all that stuff. Um, and then, you know, if they want to go to restaurant C, they get the cup again, and they make their way over. That's all great. It's all fine. But when we do... Um, a fair, now we have an issue because now we have a dual license issue, so we have to do a rewrite of this bill. Um, but these are all things that come about in these interim sessions that we're talking because everybody's kind of talking. You know, they're talking about what's going on uh, in their area and what we can do to help. So hopefully uh, our, our changes make big differences in the uh, uh, the wineries and and, and other stuff. Mike Height. This is this Wayne. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is all part of the like the agritourism um, in, in code. And and I know that I've talked to some of the people at these fairs, winery fairs, and stuff like that. And the, and they've complained that that certain ones of them they can they can sell wine by the bottle, but they they can't do samples or they can't sell it by the glass. And then there's somebody over you know the next truck over that they can sell it by the glass but they can't sell the bottle of what they're selling you by the glass so there's a whole lot of different rules and regulations that just yeah. doesn't seem to mesh very well um and i think that's one of the things you're trying to tackle is it not correct correct we're gonna make it all you know one all-inclusive kind of deal you know um so where you know everybody can go to the fair and it's all on an equal playing field i go to a winery in maryland or virginia I can sit down, I can, I can do a sampling, I can buy a bottle of wine, I can open it, and I can drink it there. Yeah. Why can't we right. make it that easy in West right. Virginia? And I think that's, that's what, our goal. Yeah, that's our goal. I, it doesn't, I, in 2023, why isn't this already in place? And, and I think as, as legislators, we sort of scratch our head when we hear these things and say the same thing. Why, why have we made it so difficult? Um, and, you know, I applaud um, – uh, Wayne and, and his uh, his committee for, for tackling this and trying to get it correct. Why are the legislators so involved in micromanaging what I would think would be a private industry function? Well, I think we, what's happened in the past is I think there th these laws didn't take into a, into account these these um, fairs and festivals and and they're sort of antiquated at this but point. But do the laws need to be that restrictive uh, at any point well, in time? Because fifty years from now they're going to look at what you you as legislators are doing mm -hmm. and could very well say the same thing. Probably not about wineries, but about something else. My point is why should the and I think this is this is kind of typical a lot of what West Virginia legislators legislators have done and continue to do is to get overly involved in things that should be at the county or the local level. So, Bill, one of the biggest things is, is West Virginia is still, under our Constitution, still a prohibition state. So anything that we do has to be allowed 
by legislative ruling. Okay, so we're not trying to micromanage it. Basically, if we if we could do it, if I could do it my way, I would say uh, all wineries are farm wineries, which allows them to grow, sample, uh, taste, sell, do, boom, bang, and just go down a list and say allowed everything that we want them to do. But because of our issues that we have with our prohibition, we can't technically do that. So then we have to rewrite things. Now, we would love to, you know, put it on, you know, on a referendum and have a, have a vote, you know, by the, by the, by the citizens. But, uh, you know, this legislature, I mean, we're 0, 0 and 4 so far on that on that angle. So, you know, you're, you're due, Wayne. You're due. <laughs> yeah, you don't know, don't hey, get discouraged, Wayne. <laughs> Just because you're batting zero. Coming, you know, <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, you, you got to at least get a, a a snip of the ball. You know, at least foul one off mm-hmm. once in a while. But uh, be nice. Know, I mean, we yeah, we would love to do that, but I don't think we can. What are what are some of the restrictions at your golf course, for instance, that you would like to see relaxed to allow for an, an experience for the golfer that's more than just come in, hit a ball, go home? So, you know, here's the great thing about the golf course is um, we are we are one of few golf resort uh, establishments, and what that does is my whole 168 acres is equivalent of being inside of my bar. So you can consume anywhere on the property. You can consume wine, liquor, um, beer, all that, all, anywhere on the property. I can sell it. I can put little, you know, temporary uh, booths out on certain holes and sell it. I can do all that stuff. But here's the one thing I can't do. I have this big open field right next to the clubhouse. I can't invite you know, 25 um, family brewers, okay, and a family brewer is your craft breweries, all right, that's the name that we give them. I can't invite them here to do a, you know, a beer festival. Uh, They can give little samples, but they can't sell it, so they're not going to make the money out of it. They're just going to be giving it away. So, you know, having them be able to come here, have samples, have a beer garden, people can buy you know, one of the, a glass of their, of their beer, you know, have a band, do all that stuff. It's the fair and festival, um, dual licensing thing that, um, is an issue that again, is something that we're looking at in regards with the POTA situation. Um, the dual licensing would allow for me to actually bring in the, the beer companies and let them sit there and, um, sell and you know um, have a good time. It, well, the irony of this to me is that if I have uh, acres where I'm growing grapes, I would ha- I would have an easier time selling alcohol on that land if I mowed the grass tighter and held a golf tournament on it than I have while I'm growing grapes to grow wine and make wine on it. <laughs> do, do, you, do you see the ridiculousness of that? Yeah. Well, it, well, I, I'll give you an example: uh, the Mountain Lake Club. Uh, up on Shenandoah, um, up up on the mountain, mm-hmm. uh, when they were going through theirs, because they they can't they can't sell wine and liquor down on the beach. They can sell beer in a can, you know, because uh, and they were like, "Well, Wayne, all right, how how much is it going to cost me to put in a nine hole golf course, mini, <laughs> mini golf course?" Yeah. I literally that's what he was looking at. If I put a mini golf course over here on the other side of the lake. And then I encompass the whole thing. Now I'm a golf resort. Now I can do what I want. Yeah. Wayne, you're, it sounds like you're looking for a series of Band-Aids. Uh, and going back to the discussion we had a couple minutes ago about a referendum constitutional amendment, uh, we are uh, restricted to a large degree about the way our Constitution was written first, I think, in uh, 1870s and then rewritten in the, uh, uh, during the Depression era. So we do have certain burdens placed on us. Uh, 
I thought the Constitution amendments that were presented a couple uh, this past summer were failed in large part because of the way they were promoted. Uh, they did not. They uh, they they were open and exposed to the public in such a way they were highly controversial. I come back sure. to the fact that that I think that something like this, it's time that we took a serious look at our Constitution and trying to correct these problems without doing a Band-Aid approach. I I agree 100 percent. You know, and I, I would love to see it go up for a referendum and, and you know, or, or for for vote and get rid of it, you know, um, and just rewrite the entire, you know, ABCA uh, laws and and many, many other things that uh, myself and Gary Al, you know, we've talked about all these other, you know, wish lists of what we could do. But everybody in leadership is afraid of, you know, well, we put it out there. Are we? Are we? Are we going to win? You know, are we going to put our neck out again? And are we going to win? I don't know. I think we would. Um, you know, but uh, you know, there's there's still a you know a, a large majority, you know, even in our our Republican legislators that you know that are 100 percent against alcohol. We know that there's 26, 28 no votes from Republicans on any ABCA bill because they're against alcohol yeah. period yeah is that mostly a southern delegation <clears throat> majority yes yeah. but it's it's also it's a little spread out i mean it, it's not all the southern delegation but i would say the majority of them are from the southern part of the state would would that re- reluctance within the legislature would that be manifested in the population as a whole? I'm going back to the referendum. If you have 25 to 30 percent of the legislators against alcohol, you would anticipate 25 to 30 percent of the electorate to be uh, against alcohol as well. Probably correct. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're each representing 18,000 people. Yeah. You know, you got to assume. You know. 25, you know, I don't even know the math on that one. I'll say, what's that, 25 too? That's a 500,000. Yeah. But even at, that that, round, even at that, we should be able to get it passed. You should, you would think so. With yeah. the sure. I think last year, I think, you know, we we had too high of an expectation with four constitutional amendments on the referendum all at one time. And when one was so controversial, it that, sort of toppled the whole thing. Exactly. And all of them died. It's, if we were to if we were to put this on the referendum, you know, a constitutional amendment to ABC laws, um, like what Wayne is suggesting, I think if that was the only thing, yeah. that it would probably pass. When you start pairing things together, sometimes people, if I'm going to vote one, no on one, I'm voting no on all. Exactly. I agree. I think if number two had not been on the ballot, yeah. one, three, and four would have passed. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Wayne, what else are you open to tackle while you're in Charleston, if anything? Um, you know, other than that, this this session, not not much. Um, you know, this interim, uh, I don't have too many things planned. I got to get back to the golf course. You know, um, you know, we're struggling with this drought, and we're doing everything we can to you know get get our golf turf you know growing uh, again. So um, you know, for me, it's going to be a quick one down, come back. And get right back into the the the, the, the grit of uh, running the golf course. Well, let's talk about the Republican Party a little bit statewide while we have a chance with new announcements sure. of, of uh, people challenging other Republicans in primaries, uh, both at the local level and at the state level, uh, because the real race now has become the Republican primary. The general election is, in fact, an afterthought for most races in this state now. Wayne, uh, your opinions on what you're seeing? Well, I mean, we we kind of we kind of started seeing the fact that, um, you know, uh, I'll use the term "eat your own" um, is is kind of what's coming about. I mean, right now I have a I have a primary opponent, and there's word on the street and that I have, I'm going to have a second primary opponent. Um, you know, so that's what you're going to start seeing is you're going to start seeing in the primaries, you're going to start seeing three, four people running uh, against each other um, in these primaries. Do I understand why I have an opponent? I don't. You know, I, I've i been extremely productive in my my three years down in Charleston. You know, um, you know, close to 50, I think I'm at 49 bills that I've sponsored or co-sponsored that have become law. I mean, my resume itself is just through the roof. Um, you know, I believe I've done everything 
to the best of my ability and in the best of you know representing my citizens. But you know, there, you're always going to have someone that's going to say no, that's not true. And I'm sure just after I said that, someone on 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 Facebook or or YouTube said no, that you're you're not Wayne. And and so you know, there the opinions of it, and so then. Once that kind of manifests, then next thing you know, you know, we have three, four, five people, you know, running for for governor, running for, you know, Congress, running for Senate, running for auditors. I mean, just on and on and on. And and we're all running against ourselves. You You know, know, I'm surprised. I'm surprised, Wayne, how many times you see in these races where somebody decides, you know, I want to I want to be the the legislative um representative for this area not that you wayne clark are doing a bad job i think you're doing a a good job but i I want your position and that's the reason i'm running um and i'm surprised how many times that happens when your legislator is actually doing a good job and you think they're doing a good job but you know it's it's they want to get into it regardless isn't there another reason though mike uh and that's ideological ideology and someone is more ideologically extreme uh, i think that is yeah. sometimes yeah. i don't think it is all the time i, I think there i see some of these races sometimes when they'll say you know wayne you're doing a good job however i, I want to be a delegate so therefore i'm going to run against you so you know and i want me personally i'm not like that if there was somebody from my district that was doing a good job i wouldn't run against them um so I, i'm surprised how many times that does happen but doing a good job is certainly very subjective as to yeah, what sure. you regard as being sure. a good Absolutely. job. And I, I kind of rotate back from my perception. It's more ideologically driven than it is how the job and, is being And done. I'll give, I'll say, you know, Charlie Trump is an example. You know, mm-hmm. there's very few people that think that Charlie Trump's not doing a good job as a senator from his district. And yet he gets primaried. So, you know, you get surprised by that sometimes. Wayne, final thought is yours. Oh, I just thank you guys always for having me on. I, you know, I appreciate uh, you know you guys being here local, helping out uh, us. You know, get our name out, get our our word out, or get our message out. And I think you guys do an awesome job. You know, maybe um, you know Rob, we might need to you know hire a secretary for scheduling. A new is coming. Well, a new is coming. Uh, p- p- persistence pays off, Wayne. You'll eventually get up. Get on. <laughs> What we've what we've learned, Wayne, is a valuable lesson. Before you drive in from Charlestown, verify. Trust what, what, what they used to say yeah. with the Russians. Trust, trust, trust and verify. verify. Right? Yeah, trust really and verify. Yeah. <laughs> Wayne, thank you so much. Appreciate your time today. All right, guys. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Wayne. Have a good one, Wayne. Have a have a great day there at eight thirty. What this.